Howdy, Earthlings. I woke up today and decided to make myself depressed. Out of curiosity, I was like, huh, I wonder when the GBA was released. Oh, 2001. So there's adults who weren't even DNA when it came out. So I did a poll, found out that 46% of you haven't touched a Game Boy Advance. That didn't make me sad because time is ever creeping forward and the Reaper continues to exist just outside of my field of vision waiting for me to let my guard down. But it did make me sad because there was an entire generation and soon, two generations that didn't get to experience some of the best games ever. But thanks to Kronos, time also gave us many, many ways to play these great games so that even Gen Z and Alpha can still play and appreciate these games. Hell, you get to do it for cheaper than we did. We had to pay $200 in today money for the system, then $70 in today money per game. The short version, I'm here making this video to convince you, Gen Z and Alpha, to play this system and its games. If you're not Gen Z or younger and you want to be convinced to play the GBA still, then you know what, go ahead and stick around. These reasons will probably work for anyone. If I manage to convince you to play, then please watch the full way through because I'll tell you everything you need to know about how to play and what to play. Why? It's 3 a.m. on a school night. I'm 13 and I'm hiding under my blankets with a worm light dimly lighting up my Game Boy Advance, playing Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga. I'm not tired. Not even a little. I think to myself as I yawn my fifth yawn within a five minute span. I'm super close to beating this boss fight. I go to press the attack button when I hear a floorboard creak. Oh crap. My mom's coming. I quickly unplug the worm light, lay down, tuck the GBA under me, and pretend to be asleep. My mom comes in, sees I'm asleep, and leaves. The floorboards creak once more. I'm in the clear. I can sleep in class. I sit in the back anyway. I'm far from the only person to have ever had this experience. I'm sure many of you have done this now too. But to me, nothing speaks of how addicting this handheld is more than that experience. And that it's so universal an experience that everyone I know has done it. And they even put it in WarioWare as a minigame. I think most of my generation has had this experience. The Game Boy Advance is as much a part of my childhood as breathing was a part of my life. From sun up to sun up again, I'd play this system. I still do it to this day. I've delayed videos and streams because I screw up my sleep schedule trying to play more of these games. There are so many good ones on the system that I might never finish them all before the Reaper comes for me. I'm not the only one who loves this system though. You can see the love my generation has for this system even without them playing it. People are still buying emulation devices just to play them. They're modding old GBAs into new shells with modern backlit screens or weird new shapes, and people still make games for it. This was a handheld that every kid my age had, and now it's a system that my entire generation still worships. There are massive communities still trying to keep this era alive, even if they have to make it all by themselves. But I don't think this system has an appeal only to the aging, after all. I played this as a kid, and I think this can still have appeal to a modern kid. My niece specifically is Gen Alpha, and she enjoyed playing Pokemon Silver. Her run only being cut short due to a dead battery in the cartridge. If she can love Game Boy Color amongst a sea of 3D hyper-realistic graphics, then I think that you can enjoy the GBA, which looks a lot better. Why? Because sprite art is timeless. GBA games will continue to look great and age well long after my death because of its sprite work. 3D games on other consoles are constantly being improved upon, made more realistic, more stylistic, and they've yet to reach the apex of what these games can look like. But GBA has long since been the peak of pixel graphics. It doesn't get better or look better than this. So in 20 years from now, you'll still see modern games made with sprites that look like the GBA. This gives all of the GBA games that modern indie game kind of feel, while giving modern indie games that classic GBA feel. For the young that play, the GBA will feel like a new world of quality indie-like games. I think this aesthetic is the main reason the system has aged so well. I think if you as a Gen Z or Gen Alpha were to pick up a Game Boy Advance and some games, you'd be very happy. It'd be like you suddenly got access to hundreds of games just as good as Stardew, and they didn't cost you a cent. Emulation has long been perfected for this handheld, and these games are easier and more accessible than they have ever been. Even when the originals are going up in price, they're still easy to find which makes you wonder why they're so expensive in the first place. And emulation has offered many solutions to a lack of real hardware. Most of you have a phone, tablet, or PC, meaning that you could play these right now. You could download the entire library of the GBA in just 15 minutes, which is part of why it's so astonishing that the Switch charges extra for its GBA emulator that doesn't even have 10% of its library. In 15 minutes, you could have enough games to last your entire lifespan, they'd be good ones too. Even today, I still find new games in this library that I missed. There were that many. And even as of last year, 
there's a new game developed for the GBA called Good Boy Galaxy, and I hope it's the start of a trend. I love the idea of living in the world where I have played this system, experienced its death, and then been around for its revival. That'd be amazing. There are also ROM hacks, games made from other games. A modder will take something like Pokemon Emeralds and turn it into an entirely new game with new story, gameplay, and even more Pokemon. Some of these ROM hacks even have the full 1000 plus Pokemon roster. There are new ROM hacks for Pokemon coming out every few months. That's the age that GBA gamers live in. Even something that would be considered technically a demake could be better than the game it was demaking. I can get 60 FPS on these ROM hacks. I can't even get 30 on Scarlet. Some of these even have online features in place still. So while it sounded like sprite-based graphics and gameplay have stagnated, that couldn't be further from the truth. Even as the world moves forward, so too does the GBA thanks to its community. It's a big reason why companies like Nintendo are so scared of emulation. Many of us aren't buying new games because Nintendo already nailed it with a lot of its older systems. Nintendo is scared because even 23 years later, the GBA is still hard to beat. This long after they've stopped producing games for it, and it's still a massively profitable industry. Nintendo moved on. And I don't think GBA fans ever will. If Nintendo continued to support the GBA, made a new sprite-based system, or made modern GBA models and games, I think it would still be just as popular as when it was still supported. There's other companies that have done this as a, you know, as an example. It's just they charge a lot <laughs> for their systems, so it's not as popular as it could be. The GBA could have lasted forever, and people would gladly support it. And since the other major companies aren't doing handheld consoles, Nintendo would still thrive because they don't have any competition. But as the hardware gets cheaper to produce, Nintendo wouldn't be able to continue charging high prices for it. So we moved on to the next thing. We can't ever settle for what we have. We have to keep moving on to the next thing, even if that new thing might be worse. Speaking of the Game Boy and what it'd be like if it were never replaced, I'm working on another video about an imaginary console I designed. It's just a fun little idea. The idea around it was a modern console that only plays 2D, and it's a handheld. You can subscribe, and that should be ready next week if you want to see that. Anyway, the games. There are tons of great ones, more than I could name, and I named nearly 100 in this video. But there are games on this handheld that will never see a release in the US, and people are translating some of them. Fan translations and emulation is still the only way that you can play Mother 3, despite Nintendo flaunting Lucas around like a trophy. You might not have heard of Tomato Adventure or Swordcraft 3, or Swordcraft in general, but these three games are some of the best RPGs to ever be released, and you can't play them officially, only on a GBA emulator. Tomato Adventure is the precursor to the Mario and Luigi RPGs, like Superstar Saga, uh, or more recently, Brotherhood. That game wouldn't exist without Tomato Adventure. Despite that game being so integral to Nintendo's history, they have yet to translate it for Western audiences. And at this point, they probably never will, considering they ignored Mother this whole time. But where Nintendo hoards, the community provides. Swordcraft 3 isn't as important as those other two, but it's part of a spin-off series made for the Game Boy Advance. It's an action RPG where you craft weapons, beat up monsters, and make friends with your familiar. A lot of people don't know about this series in general, but it's a great one. Your favorite franchises are still here too, and with tons more that lived thrived, and died on this system. You won't just find your fave franchises here, but new favorites too. Final Fantasy has remastered all of its NES and SNES games on the GBA. Mario & Luigi series, Harvest Moon, Earthbound, Pokemon, Castlevania, Metroid, Mario Kart, Fire Emblem, Zelda, Wario, Super Mario, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Sonic, Mega Man Battle Network, Mega Man, Spyro, Crash, Legacy of Goku, and that's not even half of them. There's also games for every conceivable genre too, even games from more recent genres like roguelikes are here in the form of Mystery Dungeon and Attacks. Not to mention that GBA can play Game Boy and Game Boy Color more than doubling your gaming options. There's never been more ways to play these either. The GBA doesn't exist just as a system you play games on, it's now a symbol of retro games and the retro aesthetic. My RG Nano isn't a Game Boy, but it's so very Game Boy. My RG28XX isn't a Game Boy Micro, but come on, it's a Game Boy Micro. It's only slightly bigger. Both of these things are an accessory, a part of the fit, and when we get to the modded console scene, that accessory thrives. Just look at these beautiful systems, and you can make these on your own, too. You order the parts, solder them, some of them are no solder, and you piece it together like a grown-up's Lego kit. Then, by the end of it, you have a fashion statement that plays your favorite games. Some of these kits even improve the design with new form factors, backlights, and even HDMI out ports. This is something I really want to do, but it's pricey. But that's the cool thing about GBA. It's a highly scalable hobby. It's as cheap or as expensive as you want it to be. If you wanted to keep it cheap and casual, you can emulate. And if you want it expensive, you can buy a GBA, then everything to mod it for just 150 bucks. Around there. 
it, it can be more than that because you have to buy the original GBA to mod it. It's also the ultimate conversation piece. If you break out a Game Boy or an emulator handheld in public, you're going to get questions. What are you playing? Is that a Game Boy? I thought they stopped making those. Whoa, you made that? If you really want a sense of community and to talk games with people, the retro gaming community will talk your ear off. You'll come out of a conversation with at least five more games to try out. Also, talking games with retro gamers is so much nicer and refreshing. Gaming has such a competitive vibe to it now. Everyone talks about your game choices. But you plop down and play Ham Ham Heartbreak in front of a retro gamer, they'll probably still give it a real genuine try because we know the system is full of surprises. There's shovelware on the system, but many games on the GBA are still very good. You might think something like a Hamtaro game might be gay and lame. I, I can say that, me, I'm me big homo. But look at the sprite work and tell me this game doesn't look like it'd be the best. If even licensed games can be this good, what does this have to say for other titles? Okay, I'm done trying to convince you. I'm not going to say you're missing out if you don't play these. What I'm going to say is you probably paid much more for much worse. If I haven't convinced you yet, Stick around for the games and humor me. Play at least one of the ones that looks interesting to you, and then make your decision after that. What to play. I'm not going to tell you exactly what you should play. You're able to make decisions on your own, but I am going to share some of my favorites with you. This is going to be hard for me because I'm only going to list 10 right now. If you want a more specific genre, then let me know in the comments. Also keep in mind this list is just GBA. You can still play Game Boy Original and Game Boy Color games. So 10 good games could easily be 100 great GBA games, and 100 could easily be hundreds. Final Fantasy. This series got its start on the NES and thrived on the SNES before ultimately leaving Nintendo for better hardware with the PS1. But that still gave us five Final Fantasy games that are still great and will give you hundreds of hours of game time. Since the GBA is essentially a souped up SNES, it only makes sense that Square would re-release these for the GBA. Some of these even got enhancements, like new content or improved gameplay, like in the case of the first one. I've played a lot of Final Fantasy games, and this version of Final Fantasy 1 is the best one, but Final Fantasy 1 has also aged a bit. Instead, I suggest playing Final Fantasy 4. It's got one of the best stories following Cecil, who realizes he's part of the bad guys, and goes on an adventure to seek redemption, going from a Dark Knight to a Paladin. That's my favorite for the story. And this is also the one where many of the iconic characters get introduced, like Kane Highwind. Final Fantasy V has the best class system. Final Fantasy is known for its job systems, you know, Black Mage, White Mage, Red Mage, all that. This one is known for expanding on these systems to the level that they're known for. You'll get job points to learn new abilities that can be shared with other classes, allowing for a robust level of customization for characters. People still regularly play this game for a charity event called Four Job Fiesta, where players will play and beat the game with four randomly assigned classes. It's a very fun way to play. I haven't played six much yet, but it is a lot of people's favorite. Final Fantasy 1 is a bit archaic. It's not the best at directing you where to go, and it can be hard at times. You also choose your job at the beginning, which means you can't change to suit the situation. Final Fantasy II has an interesting story about Rebellion, and its stat system is incredibly creative. When you perform actions with certain weapons, you gain stats for it. Think of it like the leveling system in Skyrim, but you get stats when those levels go up. It's very creative and way ahead of its time, but it resulted in too much farming, even for a Final Fantasy game. Tomato Adventure and Superstar Saga with the new Mario & Luigi RPG game coming out, it's time to recommend this one. In Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga, you play the titular duo as they fight a new enemy in a new kingdom. Yep, say goodbye to the Mushroom Kingdom. We're leaving to take on the awful Fawful in the Bean Bean Kingdom. This game is full of rich story as you'd expect from any RPG, but how it sets itself apart is its beautiful visuals. This game is fun, bright, and gorgeous. It's also a little silly, goofy, funny. It holds up so well, and you'll find that that's commonplace on the GBA. But the real reason it's so great is the combat system. See, when you attack, you do a quick time event, then it does bonus damage based on your performance. You also do these when you're attacked. When this came out, this kind of gameplay was revolutionary. But this isn't the first time this gameplay was done. The developers Alpha Dream made a game called Tomato Adventure. The combat features the QTE combat, but with even more styles of QTE. In Superstar Saga, you mostly did timing, mashing, and holding buttons. In Tomato Adventure, you do all that, plus pick the difference, input combos, and more. Each and every new attack has a different input method. This impressed Nintendo a lot, and they hired Alpha Dream to make Superstar Saga for them. The story is cute and silly. It's about a kid whose girlfriend gets kidnapped, and you go on an adventure to save her from the evil tyrant who wants to make kids stay children forever. Unfortunately, it was never made available to American audiences, so if you want to play Tomato Adventure, you'll have to find and play the translated version on an emulator. Definitely worth it, though. It's like getting a brand new GBA game. Good Boy Galaxy. 
This one is a modern GBA game that was made just last year in 2023. It's a Metroidvania style platformer following a little space puppo who has crash landed on a strange planet. This game takes 100% advantage of the GBA and is still fully playable on real hardware. It features 3D scenes, beautiful chunky sprites, cute characters, and silly voice work. You can get it right now on the site I put in the description and download the ROM to put on your handheld and play it from your PC on Steam. You can also put it on an emulator handheld and play it, which is, you know, an option. I did that. I might try flashing this to a physical cart sometime so I can have my own physical version of Good Boy Galaxy. But yeah, this game is great. And like I said earlier, I hope this is the start of a trend. I hope we're going to see a lot of more Game Boy Advance games. Wario Land 4. Just watch my video on this. The game is very unique and I can't really explain it in just one paragraph. If you haven't played the other Wario Land games, it'll be an entirely new experience to you. This series is a platform like no other. The best way I can describe it is to watch my video on this. Kidding, but you still should. It's like a mix between Mario and Castlevania, and even then that isn't the best explanation. Here, just here's the snippet from my video. This was before I played WarioWare games, and I never really knew anything about Wario at all. I was mostly wowed that this character I had never heard of had his own game, let alone four of them before this. The opening comes on, and the atmosphere was dark, moody, spooky. I was kind of scared, but as soon as the car started up and that funky beat started playing, I knew this was going to be something different from anything else I have ever played before. I played the tutorial, and I was wowed. I was never a huge fan of platformers. Mario always seemed like such an old and basic platformer. I never got why people liked it as much as they did, but Wario was different. I could go back and forth between screens. The game wasn't just about jumping. I could charge, I could go fast, and the game had such a different vibe than what I was used to. I was only 10, so my experience with games was limited, but I definitely still haven't played a game like this. Nintendo had always been the developer of bright and sunny and fun games, but this one was funky, ominous, and fun. So I finished the tutorial, walk into the boss room, and up until this point, this game had an eerie vibe, but it never really scared me so much as it just made me a little uncomfortable. Then I walked into the boss room. Aw, oh, look at this cute little idiot. What, you want me to beat that up? <laughs> Don't be so mean. And then after a few hits... Jesus, space Christ, what in the f*** is that? Nope. Yeah, it's a great game. WarioWare Mega Micro Games. You're probably familiar with WarioWare, but this is the perfect game for the system. You play different Wario characters as you play very small mini games in a speedy gauntlet, the speed of which increases every 10 micro games. This isn't a super deep game that's going to keep you busy forever. Let's be real, the real reason this exists is so that you have something to play while you poop. Pokemon. What was I going to do? Not mention Pokemon? Pokemon thrived here. Not only can you play every Pokemon game before the Game Boy Advance, like Red, Blue, Yellow, Silver, Gold, Pinball, and Crystal, but you have titles built just for it, like Ruby, Sapphire, Emerald, Leaf Green, Fire Red, Pinball 2. This was the Pokemon machine. There's also great ROM hacks for these that you can play, like Emerald Rogue that turns Emerald into a roguelite the game. Also, give Pinball a shot. People snub it for being a spin-off, but it's a very satisfying form of pinball since the catching mechanic gives it a form of permanent progression. Mega Man Battle Network. Take Mega Man and put him into an RPG game, then add collectible cards, and make combat an action game. Sounds like a terrible mix of too many genres, but six games means that something's working. These were also re-released. Haven't played them yet, but the GBA ones are great. Kind of mentioned a lot of RPGs though. Can you tell what kind of games I like? Mother 3. People would be mad at me if I didn't say the name. This is like Tomato Adventure. Despite Nintendo flaunting Lucas around like he's Jesus' second coming, his game has not come to the US yet. It has a fan translation though. It has for like about a decade now. I've never played it or Earthbound. But yeah, people love it. Sigma Star Saga. Made by the company that brought us Shantae is my favorite shmup. In Sigma Star Saga, you play an Earthling who's hired by his government to go undercover as a member of the enemy's army, the Krill. The lore here is really interesting with ships being living creatures and you're wearing a living suit made to communicate with the ship. You'll get into bite-sized stages where you play a side-scrolling shoot-em-up. You'll level up, unlock new weapons, make custom weapons, and explore an alien world. It's a very weird and obscure game. It's definitely not everyone's thing, but if you're like me, it'll feel handmade for you. Advance Wars. Do you like turn-based strategy games but hate RPG elements? Get out. This is an RPG lovers only zone. But first pick up Advance Wars. It's cute, tactical, and makes you feel big brain. If you want RPG elements though, you can play Fire Emblem Sacred Stone. It's super hardcore, and if a character dies in combat, they stay dead. There's a fun mod that randomizes everything if you're looking to spice it up. Damn though, that's 10 already? Well. I'll name some more. 
and I just won't say anything about them. <laughs> it's, it's not me, you know, sharing them, it's just me saying the names of games. Boktai 1 and 2. These kind of have to be physical, they had a solar pack on them that you needed to have sunlight on in order for it to work. There are emulators that can increase the solar levels, but it's inconvenient and annoying. Uh, Breath of Fire. Castlevania, Aria of Sorrow, Harmony of Dissonance, Circle of the Moon, Choo Choo Rocket, Metroid Fusion, Sonic Advance 1, 2, and 3, Donkey Kong Country 1, 2, and 3, Doom, Dragon Ball Z, Legacy of Goku 1, 2, and Boo's Fury, Dynasty Warriors Advance, Fire Emblem, Golden Sun 1 and 2, Gunstar, Hamtaro, Ham Ham Heartbreak, uh, no wait, that's, that's Game Boy Color, uh, Hamtaro, Ham Ham's Unite, Harvest Moon, Friends of Mineral Town, Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories, Kirby, Klonoa, Lufia, Lunar Legend, there's 30 more for you. I didn't even name all the good ones that I'm aware of. Just get out there and explore. Careful with physical though, they're expensive. How to play. This is the most customizable part of the process. You have two options for how you want to play these games. Well, three. Original hardware versus emulation and a combo of the two. The one that's right for you depends on how much you care about price versus authenticity. I don't personally care 100% about authenticity since if I play this on original hardware without some serious modding, I won't be able to record or stream the gameplay. That's also why I don't buy physical cards for the system. No point in doing it if I couldn't record it. But that's just me being content brained. You might have reasons for which you prefer, and they're valid, I'm sure, but I'm going to go over all the options that I'm aware of. Your options are PC, phone, or tablet emulation, emulation handheld, emulation systems, hacked console emulation, original hardware, DS, FPGA hardware emulation, modded original hardware, flashcards, GBA player and GameCube, and consoleizers. These can range from free to $500. There's a lot of options. For PC, phone, and tablet, you only need your device, an emulator, and some ROMs. As for an emulator, if you're using PC, I recommend using MGBA. On phones and tablets, you'll need an application that runs them. For this, I used John GBA. It costs money, but it's just a couple bucks. I don't have much experience with using phone for emulation because I don't like not having actual buttons, but there's plenty of tutorials for it. I also recommend buying an 8-bit Doe wireless controller to play them with because I really, really don't like those touch D-pads. I recommend the SN30 Pro. I use the SN30 original, but the thumbsticks are too small. The D-pad feels good, and that's important since you'll use it a lot. And you can get a phone mount for it, making it more like a Game Boy. Other cheaper options are the Micro, Lite, and Zero. Best of all, these are Bluetooth and will work with your Switch and other systems. Another option on PC is Retrobat, which I've been using. It is the best. It's really hard to explain. I'll just show you some video of it real quick, but it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like a console launcher menu, but for your PC. And I use this. It has all the emulators with it. You just have to find BIOS files, which are something else that I can't tell you how to find. And you put them in and then you put the ROMs in and it's just a suite for all your emulators. And you can launch all your games from that without ever having to go and find the individual emulators to run them. It's just super convenient. And also, it looks amazing. There's so many themes. Emulation handhelds are for people who are willing to spend at least a little bit. They're still very cheap though. Emulation handhelds have been around for a little over a decade now and GB emulation has long been perfected. Say for something like games that had hardware like Boktai Solar Pack or Gyro Packs. If you're wanting to play just GBA, you don't need the Steam Deck or anything like that or like the Aina Odin or something. You can get the RG28XX for just $30 and it goes on sale pretty often. It will play all of your GBA games just fine, plus some others like GB, GBC, PS1, NES, Genesis, and some PSP games. It's a little tiny though, but anything from the XX line of Ambernick devices will work for Game Boy Advance. These might seem like they're complicated, but they all come working out of the box. They're already flashed with more than good enough operating systems on them, unless you get the Nano, in which case, flash it with the funky OS, but I don't recommend getting the Nano, it's way too small to play comfortably. And uh, if you get the RG35XX, uh, there is a glitch on Golden Sun that keeps you from getting Mercury Gen, which kind of ruins the game for some people, so just something to look out for. It's very simple to transfer your games, you pop out the SD card and plug it into an adapter and plug it into your computer, then you ignore all the warnings that pop up, open the GBA file, drag and drop your game into the folder, then safely eject your adapter and plug the SD card back in. Takes five minutes. Uh, there's lots of tutorials on how to do it. You should watch one of those as they go into much more detail. If you want to play them on your TV, you can still get the RG35XX or RG28XX and they have an HDMI out port at the top. Ambernick is a very commonly bought from company and every device I've used for emulation I bought from them. You can also go through Palkitty. I've never bought a Palkitty system, but I've seen others recommend them. I've included an affiliate link in the description and comments if you want to get an Ambernick device. Big tip though, 
don't install too many games, you'll get choice paralysis and it'll take way too long to find games you want to play. Instead, only install 5 games per system and then swap them out when you beat them. Emulation systems are a little more rare. People are more into portability right now than anything. People aren't too concerned with playing original cartridges. The, the only one I can think of and find is Hyperkin's Retron systems. The Retron 5 plays NES, SNES, a few others, and GBA. My complaint with Retron 5 though is the build quality is pure ass. Cheap plastic, horrendously loud, and bad controller, and the ports are too snug. I worry I'm damaging my cards when I use it. It does have controller ports though. My biggest problem with it is I ordered one brand new, but waited a few months before I tested it, and it turned out to not turn on, and by that point it was too late for the refund. So I'm feeling a little burned on Retrons, but Hyperkin's other products are good, like their upscalers and HDMI cords. They also have a GBA console, which I've been kind of considering, since the alternative to playing original games is an expensive modded handheld or even more expensive consoleizer. Emulation stations are devices that run emulators and on your TV. It's like a little console that plays emulators. Most people use their PC or a hacked console for this. If you're a streamer with a capture card, you might want to do an emulation station and save precious CPU and GPU power for streaming or VTubing. These can be made with Raspberry Pi sets as well, or you can buy them pre-made. There's mini consoles like the SNES Classic or NES Classic or Sega's Genesis equivalent, but overall these are pretty uncommon. And unlike handhelds, I don't know of any reputable sellers. Uh, other than the NES, SNES Classic and stuff like that. A lot of them are scams. There's one by Powkitty, but I don't know anything about it. A mini PC would definitely be better, but it'd be cheaper to buy a Wii, Wii U, or some other system and hack it. I hacked my Wii U within an hour, but if you have to get a new system, get an RGXX family device, and they just have HDMI out ports. Now, I did find a mini PC brand that you can easily use as an emulation station, and with Retro Game Corp's video on how to run Retrobat on PC, then you have an emulation system on the cheap. If you're looking for something to emulate on, you can use this GMK Tech model. It won't play the highest end PC games, but it's perfectly good for indies and emulation and it's only 150 bucks. It'd be cheaper to hack an old console, but you wouldn't have Windows functionality because you could still use this as a PC. Your hacked Xbox can play a lot of systems, but it won't run websites, PC games, and stuff like that. Even then, getting a hacked Xbox 360 is more expensive than this mini PC because you need to know how to solder to hack it. If you want to go a little higher end, they have a model that's capable of playing AAA games like uh, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart and has external GPU support so it can piggyback off of another GPU for an even stronger system. They're also very small and they look like one of those fake consoles like the Xbox 720. Hacked console emulation is the chosen method for a lot of people, including myself. That's because you don't have to buy anything new. It's like an emulation station, but you don't have to buy a new piece of hardware. If you have a Wii, Wii U, or just about any discontinued console, you can hack it in some way and put games on it. If you're wanting to play portably, I recommend hacking a 3DS. If you want it on your TV, then the Wii or Wii U. Hyperkin sells HDMI cables for the Wii. This also makes it for an extremely cheap option as Wiis are everywhere. It would take way too long to show you how to do it and each system is hacked differently. Original hardware options can be pricey and really subject to availability and with less options. There are five original hardware methods that you can use. The GBA, GBA SP, GBA Micro, Nintendo DS, and DS Lite. Remember how I said Nintendo was trying to phase the GBA out sooner but couldn't? It's because they put the GBA slot on some of their DS's. This means that you also have a lot of options, but no options for playing it on your TV. If you're cool with having a DS in addition to a Game Boy, you can get the DS or DS Lite, but don't get the DSi. It doesn't have a GBA cart slot. But DS's go for cheaper than the GBA, and you can do a cool mod called the Game Boy Macro. It's just snapping off the top screen. But playing on the DS might be the premier way for you to play because the screens are bigger. The original GBA is going to need batteries and it doesn't have a backlight and they run from 50 bucks upwards. The SP tends to be a favorite because it's rechargeable and has a backlight, but it's much smaller with smaller buttons too. So some prefer the original because it's more comfortable to hold. These ones tend to be more expensive than the original too, starting at $90. Lastly, the GBA Micro is pretty rare in the US. It's incredibly small and uncomfortable, but it's cute and has interchangeable faceplates. It's uncomfortably small. Like, hands are cramping. Your hands are gonna cramp. But it was a fashion statement, an accessory. But due to its rarity in the US, you're looking at having to choose between paying your car insurance this month or getting a GBA Micro. Everyone wanted it though, which is why I think handhelds like the RG Nano, Trim UI Smart, and RG28XX were made. They were very close to the size of the Micro, or smaller in the case of the Nano. The Micro is very much a collector item. The other expenses for the hardware is, of course, getting games. The good ones are pricey, but there are a lot of cheaper ones. Final Fantasy 1 and 2 Dawn of Souls, 
20 bucks. Swordcraft Story 1, $100. This is where flash cards come in. They're fake cards that have an SD card inside. You can put ROMs on the cart, but if you're a snub for authenticity, then using a flash card feels like cheating. Nah, bro. You wanted the real experience, pay for the real experience. If you want to join us on Emulation Land, then you need to go whole hog. Get off your high horse and join us down in the mud, you fancy bitch. Kidding, I don't care what you do. But it does feel weird to spend and make a big stink for authenticity just to emulate anyway. Especially when emulator handhelds are cheaper than buying the real hardware now. FPGA hardware emulation is another weird creature, but more understandable. This stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. It just means that the CPU on it is a reprogrammable one, not like the ones typically found in your PC. Typically, the CPU is pre-programmed and put into your PC and you receive it like that. Or it's pre-programmed and you receive the CPU to put it in yourself. FPGA are designed to be changed, to have their CPUs changed. But basically, it's a set of chips that seek to mimic those found in original hardware. Technically, it isn't original hardware, although it appears to be. These are great and will be super useful in the future if the technology gets cheaper. These tend to be a lot closer to real hardware, so the FPGA will be integral for resurrecting these systems when they inevitably all die or run out. For right now, though, they're very expensive. The analog pocket uses one and it's $220 and runs only in batches. If the false hardware is more expensive and rare than the real thing, don't really see a point to it. But the main benefit I see to this is using it to make custom Game Boys without taking apart your rare originals. Right now, I don't think there's a GBA one besides the analog pocket. Funny Playing has one for the Game Boy Color, but I think they're holding out on a GBA one until the sales of the GBC one dies down, because the GBA can play GBC, and if they release the GBA one, no one will buy the GBC one. I personally love the idea of the FPGA, and I'm very excited for them to become more commonplace. We shouldn't be hacking up and dicing up our old systems just to make it pretty. If we keep doing that, there won't be any originals left. Also, FPGAs are more accessible than destroying originals. You can buy Funny Playing's FPGBC from their shop and get it in the same shipment as all the other parts for it. There's also some places that sell some pre-builds. It might be your thing. It's a little expensive though, especially if you're just starting out the hobby. Modded hardware is taking existing original hardware and modifying it with newer, more modern parts. But the core of it, the CPU and motherboard, is the original and unchanged. A bit of a ship of Theseus situation. The most common mod is near full replacement, changing the shell, buttons, speakers, and adding a backlit IPS screen. Most people will also add a charging port and rechargeable battery. These can be around $80 to $100 plus the cost of the original system that you'll need the motherboard from really depends on the shell as the prettier shells can also cost like 50 bucks. GBA Player and GameCube is the old school original way of playing original games on your TV. The GBA Player is a tumor that you put onto your GameCube then pop in the Game Boy Player disc and a cart and play. These can be hard to find and around 80 bucks for the player and disc but more for the GameCube which is 80 bucks as well. You'll need a special GameCube to HDMI converter for modern TVs as well which is another 20 bucks. The last and final option as far as I'm aware is the incredibly expensive GBA consoleizers. Intech making the cheapest one but still requires an original GBA motherboard so you're spending at least 150 USD and if you're weird about touching motherboards or putting things together yourself this method might deter you but it's apparently very easy to set up requiring no soldering. There are other consoleizers, but they can cost much more and require soldering and still require original hardware. So what method do I recommend? Emulation handhelds easily. Get an RG28XX unless the screen is too small for you, then get an RG35XXH and a mini HDMI to HDMI cord. You now have a retro version of the Switch experience. Play on the go, play at home, and you don't have to pay someone hundreds of dollars for a game no one cared about. Sure, it's not an authentic experience and it lacks the novelty of real hardware, but it's the perfect experience of affordable and having a handheld. But my personal goal is to get a modded GBA. It's a matter of personal taste and nothing beats the cheapness of an Xbox wired controller and PC emulation. I know I'm going to get asked this too. I mentioned it briefly, but how do you get ROMs? Well, I can't legally tell you that without putting my channel at risk. They're really easy to find, but if you can't find them, you could always find something else to do. Maybe you could watch that new Aliens movie. Yeah, do that. It's actually a really good movie. The main character is a synthetic human and he has some of the best lines in the movie. Yeah, Google alien rom -ulis. As for the ROMs, sorry, but that's just how it is. Many companies still consider ROMs to be pirating. In reality, it's more of a legal gray area, but they're illegal in the way that jaywalking is. Most cops won't care unless they're bored or using it as an excuse to bust you for something else. If you do manage to find them, using them is pretty easy. All you need to do is unzip the zip. If they come in a zip, then transfer it to the right folder. If that's for a handheld, it'll be under ROMs, then the folder with the system name. If it's on PC, you can make a ROMs folder, then open it with the emulator. Where to play? 
Since these games have been handheld since their inception, the locations you can play are only limited by where you can go. Most of these games are even designed with your portability in mind. Something important with portability is the need to save anywhere. Like, let's say you're hiking. You stop at one of the designated stops and sit at a picnic table when a bear walks past. But right now, you're deep into a boss fight, and you've been working on beating this guy all day. Maybe he's on his third phase and you just really can't stop right now. Now you have to choose between getting eaten or beating that boss. Good grief. What a pain. If your game isn't designed for being portable, you can't put it down without losing progress. You don't have to worry about that with the GBA, though. Most games let you save any time, and pretty much all of the portable methods have a sleep function, and if you have an emulator handheld, you have save states. On the SP, you just close the shell. On emulation handhelds, you tap the power button or use a save state and shut it off. Since we have these options, you can play essentially anywhere, and the games designed with mini play sessions in mind will be great for that. When to play. Kind of the same question as where to play. You can play on the toilet, while you're waiting for ranked queues in an online game, anytime, anywhere, all day, all night. During long car trips, I used to look forward to car trips so I could play my Game Boy the whole time. Even as an adult, I'm having a hard time choosing between playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Reshef of Destruction for 4 hours or sleeping. Honestly, as an adult, I have a hard time finding time to play things, but carrying these things around with me, I'm finding myself having a lot less excuses as to why I'm not playing something. Here's a bonus free idea. Uh, check out my podcast that's coming up, EXP Shared. It's a podcast where me, Rook, Mabel, and Connie get together and we play a game and then we talk about it like a book club. In my Discord we have chats where you can recommend games and you also can get recommendations for games and you can talk with us about the game that we're working on for that week and yeah, and then at the end of it, you have a podcast that you can watch, and then if it's a GBA one, you have a recommendation. And if you're using an emulation handheld, we're going to be talking about a lot of older games. But yeah, you could also just have a game book club of your own. Find some friends, get some snacks, drinks, stuff like that. It'll really help you go back to the times that these games were from. It'll be just like hanging out with your besties during recess and talking about your games. Having someone to share your experiences with will make this hobby go so much farther for you. Speaking of sharing, I hope you had a good time sharing this with me. I love sharing it with you. Thanks for watching, and thanks to my patrons who give me money so I can say no to bad sponsors. It gives me the ability to hold out for a good one that will actually be beneficial to me and you all as well. Thank you to all the patrons and YouTube members. If you want to join them, check them out on patreon.com forward slash Sarah's Things, where you can help support me for just a dollar. Thanks again to Nat, Selena, Marius, Yini, Worm Syrup, Rideyante, Rask, Ver, WildKitty69, Beef, Bait, Sly, Colorado Blue, Vaderson, Linky, Splackjack, and Melting Brick.